So it's just going live. What? Hey! Well, you didn't give me a... I have to rest my iPhone on a T... I'm not ready for this. Well, we'll just make do, won't we? <gasps> or not. See, I was trying to make like a little ghetto stand out of the tea kettle and my uh, and my iPhone case, and it just went right. You're going live now. Yeah, thanks, YouTube. I know what to do. I tell you, this is great human ingenuity. You do not understand. In Soviet Russia, we make camera out of bog roll and mirror. <laughs> <laughs> All right, folks. Um, I was going to talk a little bit about um, the uh, issue of uh, brainwashing. Just just a little bit, and then I'll, I'll take questions from people. Um, do let me know if this is clear. Can you say, yes, this is clear, we can see you, we can hear you. I'm over on that side for some reason. Just say, yes, you're clear. Am I clear? Is it secret? Is it safe? It's safe. Yes, yes, clear. Yes, you're clear, you're clear. Clear for takeoff, clear for landing. Let's go to the stratosphere. Okay, so codependency as um, a kind of uh, brainwashing response. This will be, be one for the conspiracy people. Um, codependence uh, in adult life function as though they were uh, in some sort of uh, cult, um, a cult which brainwashed them, us. So there's a sort of, I mentioned in the last video about popped bolts, you know, the, 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 a bolt that is on a plane that's holding the wing of a plane that gets stressed. It looks strained, it's a bit scarred up, it's got lines on it and it needs replacing. When there's actual trauma, though, um, the bolts are completely popped. Um, that's trauma. That's the difference between stress and trauma. The bolts have actually popped. It's pretty serious. Uh, we have to put something in place that binds, that breaks. So there are multiple breaks with codependency. And such is the nature of being raised in cult-like circumstances and of being brainwashed. What a great way to brainwash somebody, get them in childhood where they have no ego boundaries, they can't say no. Um, their brain is at its most plastic. It's the, your neuroplasticity is at its highest. All authority figures are listened to um, because of this. The notion of the superego as a recording device, as a, a part that listens to older superior members of the tribe so that you understand what it is you can do and cannot do in order to increase your survival and your breedability, your reproductivity. You want, as a virus, as a human virus, we want our R rate nice and high. Um, two kids would be good, 20 would be better. So a lot of our, this is men and women, you know, a lot of our core key behaviors are informed by that and that's why the superego is there and that's why the other the recording device the other people part functions in the way that it does when you're inside of a cult whether it's an actual cult or a narcissistic family unit that simply functions like a cult um, any ego boundaries that you try to form will be smashed down at first sight and you will be told that obedience is a virtue. So your superego, which is there, as I said, as a GPS system to um, allow us to live in accordance with our values and to um, move towards that which is good for us and away from danger, it creates a new value system. And in this new value system, it says obedience is the most virtuous thing. To annihilate yourself and to be uh, the best servant, the best slave you can possibly be um, is the best thing. Uh, governments do this. Uh, it was literally done in uh, Soviet Russia. They said uh, they, they, they released propaganda saying about some young gentleman who 
apparently worked extremely hard as a farmer and you know put 18 bales of hay together in a day where everybody else was only doing three or something like that so a standard is set very very high the superego will do this if you're raised in a narcissistic culture uh, a narcissistic family environment the narcissistic family environment is the microcosmic level the narcissistic culture is the macrocosmic level and so you'll always be given a higher standard to aspire to these higher standards are usually completely inhumane and totally unrealistic but that's the cleverness of them get you when you're young, get you when you have no ego boundaries and make you aspire to almost impossible to achieve high standards to keep you working. Because that's what codependents do. We work, we work, we work. We find things to do. We fix things. We are fixers. We are pleasers. So you are set with a coordinate from an early age that obedience is a virtue and service is a virtue slavery is a virtue and another thing that occurs in this brainwashing process is that we are burdened with enormous feelings of guilt because if you want to get a child to do something you can terrify the child and it will work far more powerful far more long lasting to guilt and shame the child into submission that goes straight to the superego if you just terrify the child and bully the child, you may be designated as a bad, threatening, um, undesirable, dangerous object, foreign object, separate from me. Uh, but if you use, if the parent uses guilt and shame, the child is far more likely to internalize um, that guilt and shame and to operate from guilt and shame. So I was speaking to a fellow codependent yesterday. We did our own little two-person codependence anonymous meeting. I said, hello, my name is Richard. I'm addicted to narcissists and narcissistic abuse and, and codependency. I didn't say that, and I'm not. Um, but so we had this little conversation, like, what you know, about uh, relationships and relationship breakdowns. And we both had the very similar experience as far as guilt went where we stayed far longer in a relationship than we should have done because we felt guilty and we felt like the other person couldn't survive without us. Um, I actually split with, uh, I've had two really bad relationships and a third that was, I think the girl was probably a drug addict and um, an anorexic, though I missed it at the time. I only saw it looking back. She behaved narcissistically, but I don't think really had MPD. Uh, the other two was much more serious. Um, and I, I split with them both. I set boundaries with them both and they transgressed my boundaries and I split with them and I got back with them for them, for them, not for me, because I had it in my head that they wouldn't be able to survive without me. And you go, well, that's insane. That means you have a God complex. And it's like, kind of. There is this element of codependency where we are the dark side of codependency. That's a good title for a series, isn't it? The dark side of codependency, where we are control freaks. And we do have a kind of a God complex. We certainly end up with a martyr complex. Um, I'm the one who can fix this, and I can fix you, and you need fixing. Well, hang on a second. But it's not so simple. This is a folie à deux. Oh, French. Hmm, well, it is a Friday evening after all. Folie à deux. Um, a mistake or an insanity between two people. It's a dyad. So on my part, the codependence part, I would assume that I know what's best for that person. How rude. Um, and I would assume that I can fix them. Absurd. Uh, there is this joke that I've been saying on Instagram where I'm ruder than I am on YouTube, where we act like we have magic genitals and we can fuck people better. I said it on YouTube now. No doubt there will be pushback for that. Um, but we do act like that in intimate relationships and in sexual relationships. It's extremely immature and odd to think that you can love somebody into mental health, that you can fuck somebody better. It's as though we think we are magical beings, angelic beings, bodhisattvas brought to earth to help people. It's a nonsense. 
But is it all us? Does that mean it's not their fault and it's all our fault? No, because what do they do on their part? There is a strategy that I discussed with my friend last night and um, that she saw and that I saw as well. Uh, I actually don't know that much about borderline personality disorder. I, I well, I know a bit. I, I tend not to talk about it on the channel because I like to stick to what I know more about. Plus, you have this very controversial um, argument causing overlap where it's pretty clear that a lot of people who just have PTSD have been diagnosed with borderline personality disorder. A lot, a significant number. There is data out there. Um, if you're interested, you can go on Google Scholar and have a look, PTSD, borderline diagnosis, and look at the overlaps. It's a significantly high number. Um, and then, of course, the CPTSD, which in so many ways uh, mirrors uh, borderline personality disorder in ways that we can't ignore. So I stay clear of it on the channel. In my personal life, I read about it because th those were my experiences. When reading about borderline personality disorder, I was made aware of a particular tactic called ostentatious displays of vulnerability. So when the codependent feels guilt and they feel like they should be looking after the other the other person what did the other person do frodo that made them feel that way well frequently we the codependent part of this dyad this folia de are receiving uh, regular updates signals not communication quite signals ostentatious displays of vulnerability that suggest straight to the unconscious, if you left me, I couldn't cope without you. If you left me, I may become so distraught and depressed, I don't know what I would do. Suicide is left hanging in the air. This is a subject we need to come back to because I've noticed now a significant number of parents are failing to do their job of parenting because they feel they're in a codependent relationship with their children. They feel a lot of guilt. They feel a lot of shame. And there's this elephant in the room that nobody wants to talk about, which is they're scared that their children will take their own lives. They're terrified of that. And they're effectively um, ter terrorized, terrorized by that threat, that unspoken threat, you know, oh, well, this is what I want to do. I get, you know, how I am. I get terribly anxious, terribly depressed. Nobody said suicide. No, the word suicide's not been spoken, but it's, it hangs in the air, you know. I'm young, I'm vulnerable. You know how I am. I can't cope. And I think we need to have a hard conversation. We need to have a public debate about this like it's clear that parents are feeling guilty and ashamed and they're letting their kids run rampant universities are letting kids run rampant and everybody's pissing themselves with fear over the possibility that they could say or do something wrong and cause a suicide so we have to have that conversation we have to have it in a sober and adult way it's not going to be an easy debate to have it's not going to be an easy conversation but it must happen because along with all the other things that humanity is facing at the moment uh, this is a fairly widespread problem i've become aware it's a widespread problem okay so parents have a codependent relationship with their children generally uh, many do nowadays schools and universities and, and institutions have a codependent relationship with the students clients uh, they're actually clients they're actually guests they're actually customers and that's why you see wildly strange things occurring in academic institutions across the globe and you might think this is all very niche why do we need to worry about this it trickles down it trickles down it's everywhere in our, our culture now and it's extremely damaging it's an extremely toxic poisonous ideology that's leaking into everything and we need to talk about it we need to address it but it comes down to codependency. It's actually, I would say, as important 
now to talk about codependency as it is to talk about narcissism. Uh, we need to understand the flip side of the coin. Uh, Sam Vaknin famously um, has said, for years now, uh, narcissism has become an organizing principle for culture. It's a way of understanding how we function. It, ex it, it explains economics, it explains politics, it explains everything, explains religion or the lack of religion. Um, it explains uh, poisonous uh, ideology and it explains uh, human psychology en masse. Yes, and I agree with him on that. I think it's equally as important to talk about codependency and our inability to say no. We have this inability to say no. So I was discussing this with my friend last night. Let's bring it back to romantic relationships for a second. And we said, yeah, I felt, I felt very guilty. Um, and I was, I I'd split up, I set boundaries and then I split up with them and then I get back with them again. And then I'd feel like a right plonker and then I'd be full of even more guilt and shame because I'd done the stupid thing again. And there was this ostentatious display of vulnerability the signaling, the suggestion that if you leave me, I will be ruined, I will not function, maybe suicide. This is a little, it's a maybe, it's just in the atmosphere. I don't know what I do. I don't know what, oh, I don't know what I do. Now you might say, you know, you can't say that about suicide. And I would say, well, if we can't say that about suicide, think of the power we're handing over to people. If we make suicide sacrosanct, oh, don't, don't talk about, oh my, oh, there's too much power. You can't give that to people. You can't just let people willy nilly just have their finger on the button and go, uh, I don't want to do it. I'll hit the potential suicide button. Oh, I got my way again. Yay. And it just makes them into lazy little fucking slobs, which is what we have. And you're seeing that culturally. You're seeing that culturally now. I'll say it. Tony, you're thinking it. I'll fucking say it because I don't care. We're dealing with a slovenly, entitled, narcissistic, psychopathic, enormously greedy mindset of people who are just say like, I just want I just want what I want and you go well, you're going to work for that you're going to make an effort for that no no I no working no 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 working well you, you you really should it would be the decent thing to do no 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 it don't work okay and if you don't give it to them you are terrorized it's it's all done by threat it's all done through terrorist tactics. Give me what I want or else. Give me what I want or else I will hurt myself. Give me what I want or else I will kill myself. Give me what I want or else I will deplatform you. Give me what I want or else I'll go to mummy, go to daddy, tell them a story, get rid of them, make them never be able to speak again. You, tell me we're not living like that now. So this is a broad scale problem, but it's, we can't just say narcissism is the problem or narcissistic psychopathy is the problem. It isn't. We used to say no. All of this has always existed. All of this has always existed. I, uh, in a fit of masochism, made myself uh, read uh, cover to cover, like gritting my teeth, um, uh, Nietzsche's uh, magnum opus, uh, Thus Spake Zarathustra. And you can go and look this up. He, one of the, it's like, a, it's like an album of diss tracks. It's Nietzsche's diss tracks to, uh, um, to use the hip hop terminology, to all the things that annoy him in life. Uh, academics annoy him, you know, um, pleasure seeking young, uh, uh, young men around Vienna upset him. So he attacks them. And it's done through the voice of, Zarathustra, Zoroaster. And he, uh, there's one called Tarantulas. Look it up. It's 1852. Uh, sorry. Uh, no, I'm not sure of the date. It might be 1892 that he wrote this. It's a long time ago that he wrote this, talking about exactly the things that I'm talking about here. Exactly the things that I'm talking about here. Tarantulas, it's called. 
Very, very good. Very, very good piece. Very, very good essay. These things have been around for a long time, is my point. They didn't come along when Jordan Peterson said they came along. They didn't come along. It's not... People are saying it's a modern phenomenon. It's not. These people have always been around. And this attitude, this stance, this strategy for getting things done has always been there. But we, the collective, the adults have said, fuck off. No, you go to work. You're at university to work. And then you pass exams. And if you fail, you'll be given a third class degree or a, or a fail degree. Or you'll be kicked out of university. You don't go to university to protest. You don't go to university to, to complain that your lecturers have given you microaggressions and therefore it set off some fallacious mental health disorder that was made up two weeks ago. That's not what university's for. Well, it wasn't, but now it is because university is not full of students. It's full of clients. Where does this lead? Where's this on the codependency scale? Well, all the adults that used to say no are now not saying no. The collective doesn't say no anymore. We've forgotten how to say no. This is pure codependency. We are not facing just a tidal wave of narcissism. That's not really the problem. There's no walls to stop it. There always was. Codependency may be the bigger problem than narcissism. People have always tried it on. There's always been hucksters, con artists, predators, murderers, thieves, rapists. My God, go to the Old Testament. You know, what's Cain? You know, he wants something. He's jealous. So he kills and takes what isn't his. It's, it's a story as old as, as time. But not being able to say no, that's the sickness it's for me. That's the bigger sickness for me. We should be able to say no without guilt. Ah without shame. Ah, so, Clarice, why can we not say no without guilt and without shame? Who put the guilt there? Who put the shame there? Why do we fear to say no, Clarice? That's the question. That's the question of the day. So, I was speaking to my friend last night, little two-person codependency uh, anonymous meeting. Oh, my boyfriend, you know, he left, like, in the apartment, he left evidence of psychiatric distress, like a message from a doctor, anti-anxiety pills. I'm like, wow, he just left them just hanging around. Ostentatious displays of vulnerability as signals, as communication that says, if you don't do what I want, then this. So, was I... Were you, was my friend from last night, an idiot codependent? Well, we have our part. We have our part. We have our share of the blame. But what do you do when the person you love is subtly communicating to you? If you ever leave me, I don't know what I'll do without you. I actually, uh, to be quite honest with you, in both of, of, of my cases, I didn't really believe that suicide was on the table. I knew that they loved themselves far too much to kill themselves and that they were too cowardly uh, to do that. But because of my own emotional dysregulation and my own CPTSD, my own trauma, I did engage in catastrophic thinking and I did imagine them struggling. I did imagine them incapable of living without me. Speaking as an adult here in the future and the timeline because that occurred in another part of my life when I was a slightly different person it sounds monstrously arrogant and unnecessarily burdensome my god I wouldn't let somebody get away with that for a minute now I just say no that's that's your problem that's not my problem it's a wonderful skill that we all have to develop one is saying no and the other is saying that's your problem that's your problem that's not my problem. You chose that. You made that happen. I could help you. I could offer you charity. I could give you a handout. But where will it go? Where will my help go? Where will my charity go? Where will my handout go? Do I have a say in that? You're asking me for help. 
when I give you the help, where does it go? Will you never need help ever again? Will it stop there? Come on, folks, we all know the answer to these questions. The answer is, of course not. They've now found a strategy that works. It's terrorism. You're not, it's not, you're not, it's, there's no consent here. Nobody's consenting to anything. It's not like, oh, yes, I agree. I'm going to do this for you. There's no consent. When people talk to me about abusive relationships in hindsight and they say they, they, they feel embarrassed, they feel ashamed, they feel terrible about what they let the person get away with doing and saying, I say to them, well, you know, had I come along, me, uh, on day one of your relationship and I just pulled you to one side in this sci-fi scenario and made you sit in a room and I pulled out a whiteboard and I said, right, I know that this is what you think is happening and I know that this is what the person has through omission and through commission caused you to believe to be true about this scenario and about what your folly à deux project is all about. Here's a whiteboard presentation. Please sit still. It's going to take 25 minutes, but I'll try and make it funny for you of what's actually happening. And you'd given me 25 minutes of your time and I'd written on a whiteboard. So it's clear as day. It's right in front of you. And I'm there going, do you get in this? Can you hear me? Are you, are you, are you receiving this message? This is what they're actually doing. Yeah. This is what they're actually about. Would you have gone along with it? Would you? Day one. Day one. You can walk away. You don't love them that much yet. You're not that pair bonded to them. You could walk away. Would you do it? I believe 99.9% .9 of you would have done. For all your codependency, for all your CPTSD, for all your trauma, for all your weak boundaries... Had you simply been given 25 minutes of my whiteboarding, which is a torture akin to waterboarding, but it's considered too cruel to use on terrorists, so they don't let me. My whiteboarding you, I think most of you would have said, I don't want this. Now, bear in mind, in this sci-fi scenario, you're on day one of the relationship, so you know them, you know you like them, you're attracted to them, Maybe day one of the relationship, you've already had sex with them. I still think you'd leave. If I could convince you that it was the truth, if I could convince you that I'd come from the future back in time, I'm like, hi, I'm from three years in the future. This is what happens to you over the next three years because this guy, this girl is a piece of shit and they're lying through their fucking teeth. They're using your love against you to exploit you for sex for money, for time, for affection, for fame, for security, for all these things. Ta-da! Sorry to be a downer. Obviously, you can do what you want with this information. It's only taken 25 minutes of your time. Most Netflix shows are, short, are longer than 25 minutes. So I've not taken that much of your time. Do what you like with it. See you later. Bye! I think most of you would have said, no, thank you. No, thank you. So we do need to talk about truth and we do need to talk about consent. What did you consent to in your relationship? What are we consenting to every day in our relationships with each other? How much now are people just dialing up the manipulation? How much is everybody just storming the cookie jar like fucking angry wolves just... Arr, 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 arr. Yeah, okay, great. You know what's going to happen next, folks? That cookie jar will empty. That cookie jar will empty. And a lot of people are going to be very, very angry. And I'm scared of that. I'm genuinely frightened at this point. I'm talking now at the macrocosmic level. I'm talking now at the higher level. I don't want people to be manipulated. I am little Mr. Lefty. I do worry about the oppressed. I do worry about minority groups. I don't like oppression. I don't like bullies. I don't like people being exploited. I do not like it. But I don't like tyrants. And I don't like being told to shut up. And I don't like being told I don't have a right to say what I have to say. 
and I'm not the only one. And we could be looking at a flip of a situation here because the manipulators have gotten away with it for so long and it's like an elastic band. And this is where you have the codependent flip moment and it will get nasty. A codependent who's been abused for a period of time, the elastic band goes, yes, service, I am your slave. What do you want? Another thing. Here's the other thing. What's the next boundary you need to erode? There you go. What's the next demand you have of me? A master. Yes, here you go. Anything else we can give for you because obviously you need, yes, take this, my, my civil liberties, there you go, my right to speak, yes, I'm a piece of shit, history proves I'm a piece of shit, take it, take it, when does that stop? You're, you're, there's codependents mainly watching this, so I know that you have a fight response, and I know that when you flip, it's nasty, it's nasty because it's a buildup of resentment over time. Yes, everybody here familiar with that. And when you flip, what happens? Is it a good thing? No, no, it's not nice. Then it's too much. Then we will overcompensate. Then we will overcorrect. And it will be very ugly, very, very ugly. And I'm very concerned about that very concerned about that and I'm not um, really concerned that the people who are doing this will win people have said to me about oh do you see civil unrest coming I say yeah yeah it'll be short though because the people that you're stepping on the codependents who've been giving you what you want will not be fucking around when it flips it will be short and I don't want that. I don't want that for anybody. I really don't. So there's a lot of things we need to look at. There's a lot of things we need to explore here as responsible, sane adults who want harmony, who want maturity. My God, can we try and be adults again? Can we try and get back to talking? Can we meet in the center again? Can we find our middle ground, our humanity, our love? I don't want to hurt you. I don't want to hurt you, but if you force me, what can I do? And we're getting to the forcing point. We're getting to the stage of force now. Like if you don't, then X, Y, Z. And I'm like, I'm trying to be nice. I'm really, I've been trying to be nice. I've been trying to be nice. Stop, 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 please stop for your own sake, please stop. Because if this switch is on, I can't switch it off. This is the codependent fight response. It's, and we all know it, it's nasty because as I say, it's like an elastic band that's pulled back for a very, very long time. And then when it releases, there's that much more gathered energy there. We have to look at saying no in a way that is civil. And we have to start saying no more firmly and more rapidly now. We have to look at shunning these feelings of guilt and shame. We, we can't all just be sat around wringing our hands, feeling guilty and feeling ashamed for saying that the sky is blue and that water is wet. That's insane. That's insane. There's no, there's, no, there's no future in that. There's no future in us editing ourselves and being like, oh no, I mustn't say that water is wet. I mustn't say that the sky is blue. I have to tow the party line. I have to uh, do what everybody else wants me to do. I have to fall in line and go with the flow. Well, going with the flow has got us to this point. And perhaps it's time to stop going with the flow. So now I will take questions. Please make them one sentence long. Have them end in a question mark. Understand when you hit send, I can, I don't know what's inside your mind i can only read the words that you've written so please be kind and make it as clear as you can you're very welcome saint crane i'm glad that you found that useful ah oh, now i must touch the screen my screen is resting on top of a kettle pray 
pray for the screen. Uh, Katie asks, at any point were you consumed with the idea of exposing your exes? That is my current battle. Uh, no, no, never, never. Um, but I understand the desire for revenge. Um, and I think these things are, it's partly an emotional flashback. It's partly, um, it's a natural thing. Somebody's hurt you, you want to redress the balance. You're a mammal, you're a predator. So of course, like, you know, you're, this is natural. Somebody's hurt you, you want to hurt them back. Um, it's partly an emotional flashback. So working on the emotional flashbacks, developing your emotional literacy helps. And partly it's, so that's the psychology side of it. The philosophy side of it, that's the internal, the yin, the psychology, the trauma. How do you feel? What was done to you? The yang side, the more philosophical, external, philosophical, sociological, external side is if you're still living, how should I put it? I want to be gentle, but I also want to help. So sometimes I have to say things that are painful and that don't make people feel good. They don't stroke the ego. If you're living at lower status, a, shit, a shittier life because of what they did, and you're still living with the consequences of that bad relationship and you're lower down the totem pole, or at least you feel you are, you will be riddled with desires for vengeance and resentment. Only when you start to elevate back up the hierarchy, or at least feel that you are, and that your life practically, not in terms of psychology, not your feelings, your perceptions, the realm of cognitive behavioral therapy, no. Real life, like I'm out there making money again, I'm out there dating again, I've got my mojo back, I've got my confidence back, all thoughts of vengeance go. You don't want to take revenge on them. You take, you want to take, when you're whipped, you're like Gollum and you're down low. You're like, oh, fuck you. I want to fucking, oh. when you're doing good and you're out there and you're living your life and you feel okay, you, you, you won't, you won't want to do that. You won't want to take revenge on them. I hope that helps. The codependent who forgives does create a bigger monster. What is the next step besides no contact to feel safe? Um, I'm not sure that the codependent that, that who forgives creates a bigger monster. I'm not. I'm not sure that that's a truism. Um, feeling safe is 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 absolutely uh, critical for you to live your life free from feelings of anxiety and depression. The unconscious is obsessed with safety, and rightly so. That's what we're designed for. Designed for steady on that's what we're evolved for right or designed for um to be safe so you know feelings of safety are very important in this context in which we're speaking i think the feelings of safety come from trusting that you that you trust yourself to make good decisions with people and probably right now you don't you're like, wow, I made some really shitty decisions there. I can't believe I loved somebody who was such a monster. So you don't really trust yourself. Um, and so you can't feel safe. W your brain will say focus on them or focus on NPD or focus on narcissists. It's, it's like a software fault in the brain. It, it's, it's, it's misunderstood where the threat is because as a threat perception machine, uh, brain is good at mapping externally. So it's like, where's the threat in the environment? Where's the saber-toothed tiger? It's not so good at mapping internally. That's why you need people like me to help you map internally because it's just we're just not evolved for that. Um, and actually, the, the, the real problem is um, internal. You don't trust your ability to make good decisions about people. So you have to build reference experiences over time with experience, no shortcuts that you can make good decisions with people, that you can have a good perception of people and that you are trustworthy. So any questions relevant to the topic today would be great. Uh, how do I deal with extreme guilt, shame and grief over my last relationship? If you go to the Fortress Mental Health Protection System YouTube channel, it's free. Uh, there's a pretty extensive step-by-step -step course there. 
that will help you to overcome these emotional flashbacks of guilt and shame. And they will help you to develop your emotional literacy. It will help you deal with the superego injunctions that are obviously still attacking you. You need to understand your superego injunctions, often called the inner critic, and work with them and then work past them. And then you will need to rewrite the script of your life. It's pretty deep work, uh, this. If you really want to move on, if you if you don't just want like a cosmetic fix where it's like, oh yeah, I feel a little bit better now. Okay, I guess I'll get on with it. You actually need like a real rewrite of the script of your life where you get into uh, a pretty deep moral philosophy so that you have a new map that you work from uh, where you start redefining evil, you redefine good, you redefine love, you redefine reality itself and your purpose on earth. And nothing less seems to work. Uh, everything else seems to make it rather cosmetic. So we have to go quite deep uh, to really uproot that. And it's a good thing to do, you know. It's a good thing for an adult to do, to develop their own philosophy consciously as an adult. Miss J says, I feel bad you get bombarded with questions. You're, there's a true codependent in the comments. You feel bad for me. <laughs> good feel worse. It's terrible. I'm terrified by these questions. No, I'm, I'm fine, Jess. Everything's, it's all good. Would, Jonathan, would you consider making a video on your possible method for a cure for BPD? Um, I, well, I did, I did a video, didn't I? I'm pretty sure I did, on if there was a cure for MPD, what I would do. And basically, uh, you know, following in the, in the footsteps of, of um, Sam Batman's model for cold therapy, which is you don't treat the personality disorder as a personality disorder, you treat it as a post-traumatic stress response. So I took the concepts, uh, that, that hypothesis or stance from Sam, and then I applied uh, the CPTSD concepts that I'd learned from Judith Herman and Pete Walker's work to resolving narcissistic personality disorder as a CPTSD response in the fight form spectrum. BPD would work the same way. Many people who've been diagnosed with BPD only have CPTSD. So um, the work that I do that, that helps people with their CPTSD was, would sort that out where it gets nasty and narcissistic and exploitative, you would do that uh, in the same way. If it could be healed, that would be the way to do it. I'm sorry, I can't remember the title of the video. It would probably say like, my cure for narcissism or something like that in the title. Uh, it was well received, people liked it. And I th think I was happy with it. So if you look that up, that, that will help. Um, Mood says, Mr. Richard, why can't I sustain a course of action that will lead to a relationship? Talk therapy does not work. Why can I not sustain a course of action that would lead to a relationship? Well, that's a strange question. So, sustain. So, in your head, in your map, oh, somebody sent me cash. Thank you, uh, Kimberly. You guys don't need to send me money. I appreciate it, but uh, I, I, I don't need money. Weasel Ways sent me $50. Thank you, Richard, for another dose of reality. You're very welcome, Weasel Ways. You, don't, you guys don't need to send me money. I appreciate it. Um, it will all be spent on protein shakes and not gin. I promise. Um, so in your head mood, uh, you have the, uh, a map that says there's a course of action that leads to a relationship. But as you go on the course, you can't sustain, so you can't endure. So as you're going along the course, you kind of drop off the course, like it's a race or something. Um, and that might be the problem right there is the way in which you see relationships, like a course or a race or a course of action, a strategy, a military battle plan or something. And, you know, you're really just trying to make safe, pleasant, attachments and connections with other human beings first and foremost so you kind of need to be in a warm loving space generally like if you're only trying to make safe loving connections with singular people that you've identified that based on your list of criteria you want to be in a relationship with which includes sex which includes all kinds of like 
there's like sexual politics, very intense. It's very emotional. Um, I found it useful to sort of broaden it out and just be like, okay, I'm trying to connect authentically with another person. Maybe I should be trying to connect authentically with more people than just the identified relationship person. You know, you sort of uh, it's socialism. I'm I'm trying to I'm trying to make it socialist. I'm trying to flatten it. So you so you do that with more people. You don't make it so just focused on one. Tarantilia says Mead's looking glass theory. Whoa. You see yourself as others see you. When you are working in a situation where people scapegoat and gaslight, how do you change that mirror? When you're working in a situation where people scapegoat and gaslight, how do you change that mirror? Um, yeah, wow, you made that you made that uh, question kind of trippy. Um, I I I don't know that I necessarily subscribe to the idea that you're only people are only seeing you as you see yourself kind of thing. I, I do think there are external players out there there are objects external objects out there and sometimes there's an agenda and sometimes in a workplace like a nasty culture can build up and if you're the new person there that's it is what it is man you know you're not just going to come in there and change it all um so yeah you can you can end up in situations where there is scapegoating where there, there is gaslighting why that's happening and uh, and what to do about it you have to deal with on a case-by-case -case basis um, there, there is on the codependency issue sometimes I see when people are asking me work related questions there's this blurred boundary where they kind of feel like their boss they should have a warm relationship with their boss or they should have a warm relationship with their co-workers and I remember it was one of my grandfather's favourite rants he, uh, he worked for the Leavers Company in Port Sunlight and before that he was a uh, um, a pilot for the Royal Navy. He flew planes for the for the Navy and fought in World War II. Um, and uh, one of his favorite rants was about people needing to like each other at work. And he was like, you don't need to fucking like each other at work, just do your job. Now, should you put up with a toxic work environment where you're being bullied? No. But I do see codependents kind of feeling like maybe there's this little sensitivity to what's going on in the environment that could do with being dialed down. You are just there to make money. You're not really there to enjoy yourself. Not every work environment is going to be pleasant. It would be nice if it was. Uh, but the fact of life is it, it isn't. You, you're talking to a person like, I worked nightclub security for 15 years. I did it in New Zealand. I did it in London. I did it in Liverpool. Um, in London, when I was working for security firms in London, we were taken over aggressively by Albanian gangs twice. Uh, so my bosses, I had, I went from uh, African bosses to Albanian bosses and then Caribbean bosses to Albanian bosses twice. And these were hostile takeovers. And it wasn't a pleasant work environment, but I needed the money and I got, I got paid. And... Unless you're at a chance of being knifed, you won't get much sympathy from me. <laughs> if there's no stabbing involved, it's not that bad, you know. <laughs> and if it does get, if it gets too bad, and it's it's just it's just really unpleasant for you, you know, you might have to think about leaving. But yeah, not every not every work environment is gonna be is gonna be a picnic. Um. Can histrionics be as toxic as narcissists? Uh, I would be talking outside of, of the research that I've read. I've read very, very, very little about histrionics. Um, that's a question for, for Sam Vaknin. I H says, I've been out of a relationship for quite a while now, but lately every time I meet someone, I wind up bailing. How can I feel safe enough to be vulnerable again? Well, you're not over the hurt, my friend. You're still hurt. You know, your heart's hurt. Your heart is hurt. That most sensitive part of you. The first Albanian gang that took over, uh, the, the, the hostile takeover, they were, they were nutters. But I actually quite liked one of the bosses. 
I got on well with his son. He was his son was an MMA fighter, and uh, I think it was called whatever the name of the Albanian firm was. It meant heart. It meant like this Albanian word that meant heart and and, and spirit. Um, you know, when when your heart is wounded, it's a very important part of you physiologically. Like if you get stabbed in it, you don't live very long physiologically. And if you get stabbed in it metaphysically, it really hurts. It hurts for a long time. And people can only stab you in it if you've removed your armor. If you took off your breastplate. Breastplates are difficult to get off if you know your armor. They take a while to get off. And uh, they probably helped you and you helped and you took it off and you exposed that vulnerable part of yourself. And uh, they didn't just ignore it or poke it or slap it. They stuck a knife in it and that's cost you. I don't know what it's cost you because I don't know you, but I know it's cost you. It's cost you time, it's cost you, probably it's cost you financially, it certainly cost you emotionally. And you're hurt, mate. That's all right. That's all right. You loved. You loved with sincerity. And you opened yourself up. You opened up the most vulnerable part of yourself to somebody. And they stabbed you. And now you have a wound. Good. That means you're a human being. That means you took a risk, which was the right thing to do. You took a risk with the wrong person. And they hurt you. And that's a terrible thing. The sadness in life and the suffering in life. We don't want to let the sadness and the suffering become a tragedy. Sometimes we can't help it. And it does become a tragedy. Kind of a Shakespearean level tragedy. And then I say, okay. This suffering and this sadness has become a tragedy. Let's not let it be a catastrophe. Suffering, tragedy, catastrophe. Let's do what we can to stop it from being a catastrophe. If you don't ever love, if you don't ever love again, and you never permit that again, then that would be a catastrophe. That would be worse than a tragedy. Probably right now you're at tragedy levels because it was bad. It's bad enough that every time somebody tries to get close to you again, you bail. So. You're hurt. You should accept that. It's very humbling to accept that. You should be humble. That helps. I'm in a lot of pain. I got hurt. I love that person. They betrayed me. I feel humiliated. I feel ashamed. I feel wounded. This is why we do the emotional literacy. So you can actually write down these words and you can accept it. You can look at it. Say, I feel humiliated, I feel ashamed, I feel wounded, I feel betrayed, I feel deceived. You can write all these words down and look at them. You might need to do it a few times. It will unlock emotion in you. You might cry. Um, you might get angry. Um, and then you're really facing it. You're really facing what happened. Because you, but you're not facing the real thing. You're facing, oh look, I'm in a hotel where the hotel paper says, write it down. That's useful, isn't it? You're not really facing the real thing, but you're facing down your, your mind map written version of it. And you're facing it symbolically. It becomes like a magic sigil. You go, this sigil represents the pain that I experienced. It represents, it's like folded reality. It's all here. It's all here, all that pain, that betrayal, the humiliation. I felt so stupid. I felt, I felt like such a fool. I felt so vulnerable. I hated feeling vulnerable. Why did you hate feeling vulnerable? That's emotional literacy. What, what did you hate about feeling vulnerable? What did you hate about feeling weak? What did you hate about feeling left behind, abandoned, and so on and so forth? And then you face that. And then you'll be sad, and then you'll be angry, and then at some point, if you do it with sincerity, you'll forgive yourself for being a human. 
and for loving, which is the best thing about us, is that we can love. That's the, you did the best thing. It felt the worst, but you did the best. It's like Khalil Gibran's poetry, that, isn't it? The extent to which it feels good is the direct proportionate amount, the extent to which it can feel bad. He uses metaphors like, uh, if you read on pain um, and on love, you know, like when you gouge to make a, a flute and you gouge it, you cut, you wound the wood and it's tortured, mutilated by the knife and then it makes beautiful music afterwards. That lifts people, strangers. Nobody knows you. They don't even speak your language. But the music is so beautiful now. It changes things. It transmutes. It causes people to transcend this reality, maybe for a few moments. But that's what it is. It takes a lot of courage to love. And it takes a lot of courage to recover from love. It takes even more courage to love again. But... Um, we must, we must. It is our duty. So be courageous. I think it is enough. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for sending me money. You don't need to send me money. I appreciate it. I have money. <laughs> it's very kind of you. Uh, but I have money. 93 pounds. That's a lot of gin. I mean, protein shakes. <laughs> I assure you it will be spent only on the, the healthiest of things. Uh, wonderful. Thank you very much. I appreciate this uh, gesture. The symbolic gesture for the stupid Guatemalan children. <laughs> All right, guys. Um, I hope that that was useful. Uh, thank you very much, as ever, for your time and for your attention. And uh, we will continue with these topics again, uh, as we must, for it is time very soon. Thank you.